We're here at the cave in southern New Jersey talking to the incredible 2,500-year-old brewmaster. As you know, sir, I'm from Ballantine Beer, but just for my own curiosity, I'd like to know what's kept you going all these years. To tell you the truth, the one thing that really kept me rolling along and singing a song was sneezing. Sneezing? It's just good old-fashioned sneezing. Not Ballantine? Well, Ballantine and sneezing, but mainly sneezing. You see, because every time you sneeze, if there's a nice person around, that person will say, bless you. And if you sneeze a good 10,000, 15,000 times a week, you got 15,000 bless you. I mean, you're covered, Charlie. So the sneezing is the main thing. But the Ballantine helps. Because between sneezes, it's always nice to take a drink of beer with spirit. Has Ballantine got spirit in it? Certainly, there's more spirit to it. And so has sneezing got spirit. If you want to start living a life that's livelier, live it with spirit. Valentine Beer. There's more spirit to it. This is WOR, AM and FM, New York. Attention now, come on, pull in your gut, stand up, spit out your gum, let's get on it there, let's pick it up, there you go, now uh, we're here now, so everything can come back into focus, we're here, we're gonna clean with a big fat new broom, all that stuff, that dust of all them programs that just preceded us here, we are knee-deep in Martha Deanisms here, so let's get moving. Bring it up there, that's it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Hey, it's Friday night. We don't need any more of that theme. That's, there we go. That's it, that's it. Holy smokes, I hear that already it's high school football time, and I haven't even taken my 47 laps out there on the track. So, uh, will you uh, please, in there, would you please... Uh, uh, put on uh, one of the listeners there and uh, give us a high school cheer here. Would you please bang it out? Let's hear it, baby. Clifton High School. Crying out loud. Is that crummy outfit still in business? Do you have another one? Ree, ree, hit him in the knee. Rats, rats, hey, the wait. Knee. Easy, easy. We don't need that kind of cheer. I know a couple of them myself, baby. Oh, wow, it's high school football time. Will you please sneak it in there, Bob? Here they come. The band is marching out across the field. The baton is swirling and slashing at the air. And there we are, running up and down the sidelines. The B team, getting ready for the big game. Our jerseys itching, our jock straps sweating, ready to go. Bring it up. <laughs> Hold it there. Now you keep that in the veins there. Oh, let me tell you, one of the most... <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to have to direct this to people who, who have played football and uh, also kids and types who have gone to football games. I don't know of many more exciting moments in life than before a football game. I mean, if you're on the team, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the 29 or 30 guys that have made the squad... And you got your purple wool jersey on your back, you know, or a nylon jersey. And you got a big number 74 on the back and the silver pants. And you got the great big silver helmet. And, uh, and you're down in the dressing room. And you're getting all dressed up. And off in the distance, you can hear somewhere coming down, drifting through the walls and under the, under the door jams and through the transom. You can hear the vague sound of the band out there marching around, making its uh, formations out there, you know. And you, you can hear it being played through the PA system, the crowd's roaring. And you're sitting there on the bench, you know, you spit out like that. The coach comes by and claps you on the shoulder. He says, all right, Shepard, let's keep your behind down tonight. 
And not only that, Shepard, listen for the signals, will you? Listen once. All right, man, give them hell. And then he walks on down the crowd, banging guys on the back and hitting them on the muscles. And you sit there, you know, oh, gee whiz, wow. We're just about ready to go. It's the first game of the season. The band is marching back and forth out there. And it's still hot, you know, because summer is still lingering on. And you're waiting for that call to go out on the field. And then the coach stands up on that wooden bench at the end of the shower room and he says, All right, guys. All right, guys. In about five minutes, we're going to go out. We're going to start another season. Now, all of you know that last season, we had a lot of troubles. But well, this is a new season. We are now all in all on the record. Let's see if we can keep it that way. And not only that, all of you remember that we lost the first seven ball games last year. You know why that is? Because we got off to the wrong start. Let's get off to the right start this year. Now all of you stand up. Let's sing a couple of choruses and a school song. And then let's get out there and give them hell. And then the band roars and the door slams open and you run out in single file. You know that bit, running out in single file through the stands and all the chicks are looking down. You pull your helmet on, you go tearing out over the sidelines and way down into the end zone. And somebody has a ball, maybe two or three of them, and you start tossing them around, you know, that casual, snotty way. You're throwing the ball back and forth, and you look around, you can see the cheerleaders down there getting ready to give off at the first cheer, and the lights are gleaming down on you. This is the first time you've, you've worked out under the lights. And it's a real ball game, and you can see way down at the other end of the field, the guys in those dark blue and white jerseys. Horace Mann is down there, and they're making their little circles back under their goalpost. And then the band again strikes up and starts marching across the field. Here they come. And of course, you run right through the band, you know. So, oh, toss me one, Shirley. Let's go. All right, now, all right, line up 17, right. Let's take number four, 13, six, all right. And do it, well, let's try the right cross, series D. All right. All right, ho, ho, hey, ho, ho, ho. And you go charging right through the Sousa folks. <laughs> Well, this is a this is a feeling that uh, that uh, anybody who's ever played football knows very well that 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 wild feeling of excitement before the first game. Uh, it's probably how many how many games have they played so far? Is this already two, three games already? Two games already? Well, then they've already got it under their belt. And speaking of belts, uh, I remember I remember one first night, first game. And uh, we were, it was the first game I ever started, as a matter of fact. And uh, we're running around out there under the, under the lights, and finally the, the, the toss is made out in the center of the field. And we, we are to receive. And, uh, you know, gee was wow. So, all right, we lined back. I was a lineman, so we're, we're, I'm right up there in front. I figure, oh, if they try an onside kick, boy, they're not going to get it past me. And I'm kicking the dirt around a little bit and spitting. And I see those guys sweeping up, and there's that instant before the kick, you know, right after the first, right after the first whistle blows, and the game is in, is now in in actual official time. You can see the big clock starting to go, and those guys come sweeping up, boom! That ball goes, and it goes whistling right out of bounds. Oh, all right. They kick over. They take the ball back five yards, and they line up again. So we move up five more yards. Uh, the game has not yet started officially. That ball just whistled right out of bounds. And here comes the kicker. He's sweeping up to the line again. Pow! And I see that ball arcing up as a beautiful kick right over my head. You know, it goes whistling back into the, into the secondary. So Shepard is picking out his man. He puts his head down, and it seemed like almost instantaneously, my head went down, and pow! Pow! Six guys hit me. The wind knocked out of me for the first, just the first instant like that, and they're bringing the guys, the guys are bringing out the water, you know. <laughs> Shepard's lying there flat, and what, 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 what? And somebody says, Shepard, why did you cross? Get up, get up for Christ. And in we go into the huddle, and the game has begun. You don't want to hear any more about football, do you, tonight? But that is an exciting feeling, and you know, you never hear much about that. I, I, I constantly hear guys being interviewed in football interviews before and after the pro games and nobody talks to him much about the feeling uh, that that comes into a guy before the kickoff and you look down there and you see these other guys working out 
or, or, or the, the feeling in, in a huddle, or the feeling in the, the moment that you have made a fantastic boo-boo. Like, like missed the tackle. Everybody in the crowd in the, in the, uh, on your team knows it. You know, you've missed a key block. <laughs> and, and somebody got nailed. <laughs> and, and it was your fault. You, you didn't... Uh, I'll never forget one time, you know, speaking of uh, key blocks and nailing things. Do you want to hear more about football? Awful moment. Uh, I, I, I get up and I, I come trotting back to the, to the huddle. And it was a crucial ball game. I, the, the football team that I was involved in, the high school team, was, was uh, involved in a state championship playoff. We were about an, oh, maybe about the third or fourth game in, and we were hot favorites to win this state championship. And so it was a matter of honor, you know, not to let anybody score, any of this stuff. So I come trotting back into the, into the huddle, and the, the quarterback was sort of kneeling down, and he was talking down into the dirt. And he says, uh, I don't really have it. I'll get now I'll stop somebody 22 hour out. And I, I, I get up. I figure I, I, know the, I know the play, see? So I go, back into my, I go back into my slot, and I listen to the signals being called. And about halfway through the signals, I realize he's not calling the play that I thought they were going to use. And he's going, ha, 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 well, all I figured I could do was to try to get the guy ahead of me who was trying to block the nearest guy to me, which was the wrongest thing I could have done. I put my head down, and I, I, I go into this block, and the next thing I knew, it was one of the weirdest sensations I've ever had in my life, the next thing I knew, I saw the ground coming up at me. It was without even any feeling at all. The ground is just going, ooh, the ground is coming right up, and that was it. I knew nothing else. The next instant, it seemed like almost as though somebody had, like I blinked my eye. The next instant, I am looking up at the tile ceiling. I, I'm, I'm looking at the ceiling, and, and there's this guy in a white T-shirt, and he's got a sponge, and he's, he's putting a sponge on my head, and, and I am down in the dressing room. And I can hear way out somewhere coming through the air conditioning system and under through the door jam and through the transom. I can hear the crowd going, ah! You know, the football crowd, the game is going on. Old Shepard's lying there, and you can hear the showers dripping in the next room. What the, what, what happened? What, what, I didn't even remember starting. I didn't remember the game. I remember nothing about it. And I, I what, what, what happened? And, and, the, and the, the, the trainer, he's got the sponge on my head. He's one, he says, he says uh, when are you, you going to learn the plays? When are you going to learn the plays? I said, what do you mean, when am I going to learn? What, what, what happened? He says, what, what, what do you do? He says, he's, he says uh, uh, what do you mean? What, what, he says, uh, Sajek, run right into you. He says, you, 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 he says, you want, what did you do? You get right in the pattern. He says, he belled you right in the back of the head. Didn't you feel it? Well, it seems that our fullback <laughs> was supposed to go right through the slot where I was. And he had put his head down. You know this kind of shot where the guy puts his head down, sticks the ball in his gut, and just goes barreling in. Well, he barreled right in, and guess whose neck was right in his way? There I am standing there with my arms flying, and pow, I get it on the back of the head. Well, <laughs> these, these moments, uh, no one ever discusses that. I never heard anybody uh, interview a football player after they've carried him off the field. I said, Fred, what happened in that play? What'd you do? Well, I can tell you that almost every football player who gets hurt has loused up. And that's, that's almost, inv <laughs> almost invariably why, why, a guy, uh, why a guy gets hurt. The, he, uh, he's done something, he's, he's uh, missed a signal, or he has gotten off the mark slowly, and he's not made the block. Or, in other words, uh, he is somehow slightly off. I remember one time, you know, speaking of, uh, speaking of great moments, football games, uh, we're running around uh, before the game. And uh, we're running around on, on the sidelines. You know, the, uh, football players love before the game workouts far more than the game in many ways. You know, the chicks are yelling and hollering, and somebody always throws the ball back near the stands, and you go trotting back, and you throw the sweat all over the crowd. And, and you know, the whole you're playing it big. You know, you feel like King Kong there among the daisies, and you you pick up the ball and you throw it back to Joshua, and somebody picks it up and kicks one out to Chinnis, and and you go back and start running plays. You know, a great feeling. Well, I'm running around there, and, and uh, the band, there was a band, uh, the, the marching band was all, had, had filed into the stands and was all now up right before us, was all filed up and sitting in the stands, and they were, they were starting to play little things. You know, those little, little funny things, they were tooting away on the, on the uh, high school song, which incidentally I never learned. All the years I was there, I never learned, <laughs> never learned this song. You know, it's terrible to hear somebody give a cheer for you. And they don't realize that they're cheering the guy that has just loused up the key play of the game. 
And that's why you're being carried out heels first. Now, I'll, I, 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 S, H, E, B, H, A, Chabot! And, and, and everybody on the football team, oh, you, oh, get out, will you? You know, I kind of, <laughs> they're carrying up. But nevertheless, uh, one of the great moments uh, I remember at a football game did not involve football players. It involved a guy in the band. And I will always remember this because it was one of those things that I always wanted to see happen, and I actually saw it happen. The band had filed in, and I and they were right back at the 50-yard line, and we were sitting down on the bench. We were we were waiting for the game to begin, and the coach was saying something to us. We were all sitting down with the park is over and all that, and uh, a couple of guys were were walking around. We were getting ready to decide what we were going to do, or they're going to take the toss, or whether they're going to take the kick, or to uh, or or to receive or kick or what, you know. And all of a sudden, a ruckus broke out behind us. You can hear a little, a little hoopla going on. I turn around, and I see that two of the band guys are having a fight. There's one guy who's got a trumpet in his hand, and the guy who's behind him is slightly above him has got a clarinet in his hand. And he's a great big lunk, and he's got this clarinet, you know. Well, the, the guy with the trumpet hollers something up at the guy with the clarinet. And, I, and we're all tur everybody turns around like that, you know, to see what's going on, because there's a big hoopla right behind us. The guy with the trumpet says, yeah, no, son of a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy with the clarinet says, well, here we are. Oh, you say that again, Mac. And there's a pregnant pause, and the guy with the trumpet says, yeah, 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 yeah. Another that twice. Well, the guy with the clarinet comes down the aisle. He just hops over three chicks that played bass drums in that. And he belts this guy with a trumpet so hard, believe me, you could hear his teeth rattle all the way down there on the field. Pow, like that. He turns a somersault and flies right over the stance and lands flat on his back right down by the bench. He gets up swinging his trumpet. He is going to hit the guy with a trumpet. With that, the, the, the clarinet player comes tearing down through the band and he's holding his, he's holding his clarinet the way Marischal held the bat. And, and they spar for a couple of seconds, and with that, the, the trumpet player makes a duck. He goes in to try to hit the guy in the ribs with his trumpet, and the guy with the clarinet gets him a clip with the clarinet like you never saw. The clarinet bent like a U. It was one of these silver clarinets that goes going like that. Hit him right on top of the head. <laughs> We're cheering and yelling. <laughs> Well, boy, that guy was like a bull. He was—he he really was, he must have weighed 290 pounds, this clarinet player, and he was about six feet three. Well, he knocked the trumpet player down. The trumpet player is crawling around on the ground looking for his mouthpiece, and our coach jumps up and runs over and grabs a hold of the clarinet player and says, you're coming out for practice tomorrow. I am telling you the true story. He says, you're coming out. What's your name? The guy says, Wagner. He says, you're coming out for practice tomorrow. You be at the field at 3.30. You hear that, Mac? Your name Wagner? All right, 3.30. Well, do you know that that guy went on to become an all-state tackle? He never played football in his life. He was just a, a natural, tough guy. He went on to become an all-state tackle. Later went out to the University of Washington, or one of those Western universities. I think it was Washington. Became an All-American, and believe it or not, later played about four top years with the pros. All because of one night clipping a guy on the top of the head with a clarinet. It was a Sears Roebuck clarinet, and he belted him. And he was scared. Ooh, you know, uh, He thought the coach was going to come out there you know, grab him and yell at him and say, Four years in, in ninth periods, Mac, or you're kicked out. Oh, wow. Uh, speaking of near misses, this is W-O-R-A-M at FME, New York. Oh, wow. Miller High Life, the bright, clear taste in beer. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. There's only one champagne of bottled beer. Sparkling, flavorful, distinctive. Miller High Life. Brewed only in Milwaukee from a century-old recipe, Miller High Life has a rich heritage and tradition. A bright, clear taste, unequaled, unquestioned, unchanging. Available on tap, in cans, and in the familiar crystal clear bottle. Miller High Life is always sparkling, flavorful, distinctive. Enjoy Miller High Life yourself. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. Yes, Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. Amprevu is coming. And you'll Who? never be the same. 
subject? Well, I, I tell you, I was once taught a lesson. Uh, you know, I think that the athletics are, are one of the great areas for people to learn a little of the realism and a little uh, learn a little about the hard, the, the real way the life works. Now, I'm not talking about athletics in the backyard. You know, this is just rough and tumble kids uh, rolling around and hitting each other. But I'm talking about organized athletics. And uh, I learned one of the great lessons of my life which probably, had I not learned it, I would have gone on to become Steve Allen. <laughs> you know, I've always felt that, that guys that go on and make it really big are guys who never got that judicious kick, you know where, right at the right moment. Well, I, you know, I, I, first of all, I have, to, I have to clue you in here. When I was in high school, I was a big kid. Uh, I, was, I was big for my age. That is, I was wide. And uh, in high school, I weighed about 200 pounds. Oh yeah, solid, solid blubber. I weighed about 200 pounds, and I was I was almost impossible to tip over. I had a lower center of gravity, believe me, than a Volkswagen loaded with rocks. And uh, it was <laughs> really that was my my great uh, my great talent was that I you couldn't push me over. And so when I when I was always playing in the line, I used to play guard or something like that. And once in a great while, I would play fullback. But uh, my job usually was to just sort of rear up and, and uh, spread my arms and grab whoever came near me. Now, that was when we were on defense. Now, on offense, my job was just to simply charge forward and run over guys, uh, knock other guys down. <laughs> now, now, in every play, I was either to knock them down to the left or I was to knock them down to the right, which is fairly simple, you know, unless you run up against a guy who's 297 pounds whose job is to knock you down. Well, one, one day, I'm out, I'm out, you know, I'm real cocky. You know, the thing about it, when you leave, when you, when you start playing these things, you get, you get real, you know, you, boy, you feel, you, you, get the, you get the shoulder guards on and everything else. You feel like you're impregnable, you know. And so one afternoon, this happened in practice. It was one of the great moments of education that I've ever had before or since. And I was on the freshman team, the ace freshman ball club, and we were scrimmaging against the top varsity. We were just scrimmaging. And it was one of those things, a little practice scrimmage. And so old Shep is down there in the line, and opposite me, there were two guys whom I will never forget because they later went on to great fame. One of them went on uh, to another West Coast university, became an All-American, and later played for the Washington Redskins for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> and he was also a state champion wrestler, but a very nice guy. And uh, he was a very jovial cat, and not very big, by the way. Not very big, but he was about as wiry as a boa constrictor. And uh, very, very, uh, very, very adept at what he did, and had a, had a peculiar sense of humor. Now, next to him, playing tackle, was a guy who later became an All-American at Notre Dame. And, by the way, was the first football player of, of a national caliber who was killed in World War II. Uh, he was a flyer. But uh, he, he, they were both opposite me this day, and we were just in high school, and I was a freshman, and they were, you know, they were seniors, big top seniors, and they were famous in the school and all that. Well, I was pretty cocky, see, and I figured this is, this is my chance to really show, show old uh, Huffine what I can do, you know, the coach, I'm ready to show him, boy. And uh, we, had this, we had this line coach who had been the last All-American that the University of Chicago ever turned out. And for those of you who think the Mets are a bad ball team, you have no idea how absolutely stinko 
the University of Chicago's football team was. It was really a joke, that football team. And they were in the Big Ten. And every year, the University of Chicago would somehow scrape up one football player. And the rest, they'd have all these little skinny patsies with glasses who loved the game and all. And uh, they would all run around out there against Iowa and teams like Indiana and Purdue and Michigan. And there was always one guy who was stemming the tide. Well, Coach Shanner, who was our coach, he was our line coach, he was the last All-American that Chicago ever had. And this was one tough guy. He had a neck, Bob, really. The neck was about as wide as the average guy's waist. And it did not even go in at his shoulders. It, it blended right with his shoulders. He had no discernible neck. And the funny thing about it was his ears grew right out of it, came right out of his neck. And, and he had a forehead that was about, oh, I'd say a quarter of an inch high. And, and he had this short, fat, squat nose. And he had, he had a big lantern jaw. And he's the only guy I ever knew that had stubble all the way up on his forehead. He had stubble all the way around. It was blue stubble. And he wore a little pair of very tiny, round glasses that stuck into his cheeks. You know, they were those, like, they, they looked like the bottoms of, of Coke bottles. Stuck right. He had no, he couldn't see anything, this guy. But he was like, he reminded me of Alice the Goon. You ever see pictures of Alice the Goon? And uh, poor old Shanner had the worst eyesight of anybody I ever heard of in my life. And he also taught civics in school and was the line coach. Well, Shanner had an interesting theory of coaching. Uh, Shanner did not discuss the game with the players. He did not even go over the fine points. When Shanner saw you were doing something wrong, he kicked you. Now, that's the way Shanner got results. He was a Pavlovian. And he felt that if you kick guys enough, they would soon start going in the right slots. And, <laughs> and I can remember many an afternoon bending down over there, you know, on the line. And, and, and Shanner, Shanner said, hold up a minute. And then I'd hear this boom, 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 coming up behind me. And thump, I'd get kicked right out from under my, believe me, right out from under my shoulder pads. And Shanner would turn around and walk back. He wouldn't say anything. Well, he knew, he, he knew that you knew where you were lousing up. I mean, you know, when you were goofing off and you just get down and you start all over again. Well, that was the kind of a scene we had going. Well, he coached also the freshman football team. And so every, every day we would work out and we'd scrimmage and then we'd have our little freshman football games against the other schools, which we invariably won, by the way. We would have these on, on usually Friday afternoon and the big games would be played Friday night. That is the varsity games. And, of course, we would all get passes and tickets to go see the varsity game. We'd wear our sweaters and sit down there. And we were, the, we were the big coming hopefuls. And we were always hollering down at the big guys on the varsity. Hey, Al, hey, Al, come on, boy, hold on to that ball, will you, Al? Little freshman punks. And we're talking to a guy who's been all state six years straight, you know. He, well, of course, we had a high school that let him do that. You know? Hey, Al, hold on to the ball. Come on, Mac. And they'd look up there at the freshman. So it was that kind of a scene, and one, one, one day, it was a Wednesday or a Thursday, we are having a little scrimmage against the varsity, and I am feeling my oats. I have had my Wheaties that afternoon, and I've had a good lunch, and I'm really feeling full of it. And uh, just before our scrimmage, uh, our history teacher, Mr. Wilson, who also had something to do with the freshman team, he says, come on, he's come on, God, give him hell, Shep, come on, come on, give him I said, all right, boy, I'll go out So I really felt, uh, I was really feeling good, you know, that, that feeling cocky and smart. And I, I was feeling like we had, we had won about seven straight games, too. And uh, it was a very easy game. I thought, this is a great game, nothing to do with this game. And so we're scrimmaging against the varsity, and they're just running through the plays. Well, the freshman team is not just running through the plays. The freshman team are grunting and sweating. They're, they're really playing this ball game. And so every time the ball is snapped, they were running a series of plays. Shepard would go down and up and in and out, and he would dig in and, and slam it at the quarterback, a guy named Billy Kyle. I would slam it at that quarterback, and I would dump him every time. And Kyle looks back over his shoulder. Remember, he's the varsity quarterback, so he looks back over his shoulder. And he goes back into their huddle, they're, they're running their plays, and he says something to the guy ahead of me, who was Hercules, or ahead of him, he was the guy that was playing ahead of me. He says something to Hercules, Bariolus, who was the guy I told you who got killed, who was the Notre Dame football player. And so Bariolus comes back into the, into the line, he looks, looks across at me, and he says, Hey, Shep, he says, what are you trying to do? I said, nothing, what do you mean, Hercules? He says, what are you trying to do? He says, look, he says, when, you, when, when, when you're cutting in line, he says, don't raise your shoulder like that, kid. 
He says, stop raising your shoulder. Oh, come on, Herky. I'm getting in there, Mac. And so then I hear Kyle go, hop, 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 hop. And Shepard slams in and knocks Kyle down for a loss. Well, we line up again. And, and Herky says to me across the line, he says, now take it easy, son. Just take it easy. And next to him, Ray Frankowski, who has not been saying anything in this entire this entire exchange, looks at me. He says, he says come on, come on. Now. It's, it's hot out here. He says, take it easy, kid. You know, I said, oh, come on, Frank. What's the matter? Can't you block me? Well, with that, Frank takes a look at Herky, and the ball is snapped. Well, I have never been in my whole life up to that point caught in anything like that. And to this day, I don't recall exactly what they did, but it's called a double scissors block. Now, this is the kind of block where they, 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 they open up. You see, it's a mouse trap. They open up, and Bariolas hit me high with three knees and four elbows, and Frankowski hit me right around the groin. And between the two of them, they whipsawed me back and forth, and I landed on the back of my head, and both of them ran over me. Both of them ran quickly over me with their spiked shoes, <laughs> and it all took place in about, I would say, a minute, oh, maybe a, maybe 30 milliseconds. Well, I got up, my, my nose is bleeding, I have, I, have a, I have a shot on the elbow that even to this day hurts, I have a pain down in the gut that has not stopped since that time, I don't know what they busted down there, and I go limping back, and Shanner, at that instant, I go down into the end of the line again. Shanner comes running up and kicks me one like I'll never forget. Over I went. I bumped into Frankowski. Frankowski says, I told you to take it easy, kid. That never would have happened. Now, you don't, uh, you got a long time to play this game. Just take it easy. You got a lot of time. Just relax, son. And it was that night, that afternoon, that I learned the lesson. You got a long time to learn to play this game, son. And there are a lot of guys that know how to play it just a little bit better than you know how to play it. Now, they ain't always showing that they know how to play it better. They ain't always throwing their shoulders around and spitting and yelling. But be careful. You are liable to find yourself hitting the fan. It's going to be you that hits the fan. And you are going to do what all that other stuff does that hits the fan. You are going to fly all over that field. And there ain't going to be no coming back. From that day on, I never quite blocked. I never quite dove into the line with the same pizzazz that I'd had before. There was just always that slight little instantaneous hesitation. And Frankowski and Herky Bariolis had instilled in me the realization that no matter how good you are, off there in the distance, looming just on the other edge of the horizon, are two guys who are about three miller watts better. And they ain't loath to show you. After you go, that's it. <laughs> let's let's get the. Oh wow! I don't know how I got on these football stories. I didn't intend to do that tonight. Yeah, it's a football night. You'd like to hear some of them? Those football stories. I'll tell you. Uh, uh, the the instant though that you know that you're really hurt in a football game, that that's a that's a that's a funny moment. Now you've always heard about football knee. And, uh, yes, you have. Everybody knows about football knee. Have you ever heard anyone describe the instant that he got his football knee? Well, I'll describe it to you right this instant in case you're interested. I'll never forget it. And it happened on a fumble. And I had not fumbled. Uh, I, I, was just, I was just in that big pile. You know, most people, when they watch football games, never watch the line. They, they just watch that ball or they watch the passer. But there's a lot of action going on between them guys that are all laying down there on the field. Well, there's a lot of action. And the ball was snapped. And the next thing I know, somebody hollered back at me, Fumble! Grab it! Fumble! And, and I, could, I turned around. I just, just for that brief instant, I turned around, which was a bad thing to do. I turned around, and I saw the ball rolling away from the halfback, who was supposed to take the handoff from the quarterback and cut back around to the right side of the line. And I saw that ball roll just for that instant, and I, I kind of half pivoted. And the next thing I know, somebody hit me from the right side. I just felt that hit, and I was off balance. And you, <laughs> have, you, have you ever, you know, the, you know the, the, uh, the sound when you hear a model airplane breaking? You hear a lot of little balsa pieces of wood cracking up? Well, I heard this, 
it was my knee. I, oh, wow, this fantastic pain roared up, started from the bottom, roared all the way up, and then was gone. And I dove into the pile, and everybody else was piled up on that football. The guys were yelling, whistles were blowing, and we lost the ball. I got up, and I felt great. I walked back to my position, and we, we went back for our defensive huddle, and I'm about halfway back, and all of a sudden, no leg. It just went, ooh, down I went, oh, oh, what a pain, oh, 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 wow, wow, oh, wow. And, and, and they're helping me off, and I go, oh, wow, wow, and I figure it's just sprained, it's just sprained, oh, wow, wow. And I sit down, the trainer takes one look at it, he says, oh, boy, well, that's the seventh one this month on the squad. That's another football knee. I said, when does it go away? Oh, wow, wow. He says, never. He says, you got yourself a football knee. And from that day on to this, from that day to this, it's been football kneesville. Yes, sir. I can tell when it's going to rain now. On those, on those humid days, I can tell when the hurricanes are coming. It's my old football knee twinges. There on the left side once in a while. I remember that brief moment. Just looked back over my shoulder, saw that ball skitter. I heard somebody on a fumble! And that was it. For all time. All right. You don't want to hear any more of this. Let's see. You got that Prestone thing in there? Hit it there. Never pick up a stranger. Mess with Don't this. put your car in danger. Don't Now's the time, team. the right time to change her. Da, 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 pick up press stone and a freeze. Never pick up a stranger. Pick up press stone and a freeze. Press stone and a freeze coolant is a product of Union Carbide. Oh, get total protection with Prestone Antifreeze. Prestone Antifreeze with its exclusive magnetic film protects against freeze-ups, against rust and corrosion, and the Crudleys. Substitutes just aren't the same. So remember, never pick up a stranger. Da, 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 da. It's just play the cut over again, but I'll have to sing it. That's all. Never pick up a stranger. Da, 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 da. That's in my... Best Barbara Streisand voice. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, Rover, yeah. Oh, boy. If you want to pour your Prestone into a brand new automobile this year, I would suggest that you look up the magnificent Rover. Incidentally, somebody called me the other day and said, uh, how come all of a sudden you're turning against Peugeot? Well, they're, they're automobiles in two totally different price and class ranges. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the uh, Rover automobile, if you're interested in genuine top flight luxury quality, and in fact, an automobile that is very, very comparable, and uh, it sounds like a wild statement here, but and has been done by many publications, is comparable to the Rolls Royce, I would like to suggest the Rover 2000. I ordered one about, oh, it's been about a week or so ago. And when I get it, which will be in another week or so, I hope to drive it. Yeah, it takes a while to get the one. I wanted one with special glass in it. And uh, that, that green uh, sun glass, I like that, uh, that sun tint glass. But nevertheless, for those of you who have driven sport cars and uh, you feel that you can't have the sports car seen anymore that uh, for one reason or another, and you still like wonderful suspension, you like superb construction, and you like the feel of a sports car and the performance of a sports car, I certainly would highly recommend that you investigate the Rover 2000, which uh, was a car that was five years in the development. And uh, they had to build a complete new plant to build it because of the, uh, the technical... Uh, the technical qualifications of this car are so unusual they could not build it in the, in the ordinary plant. Now, uh, I can't tell you all the reasons why, because we've only got a one-minute spot here. But uh, if you are interested in seeing the Rover, there's a place over in Jersey. The, the dealer I'd like to recommend tonight is Chapman and Stormer, and they're in Hanover, New Jersey. And if you want to know more about the Rover, ask any of your sports car friends what they know about the Rover 2000. Uh, I'm sure they know, and as a matter of fact, in the current issue of, uh, let's see, it's the November 65 issue of Road Test. Pick up 
the November 65 issue of Road Test, and you will find out that they have nominated this car as one of the, probably one of the greatest cars built in the world today. Oh, I don't worry about it. Well, I don't care what he says. I've got my sponsors. He's got his log. Well, uh, let's see what else have we got here. <laughs> and, oh, one other comment, too, we've got. We've got a, uh, we've got a, uh, you know, it's funny uh, about uh, when you get involved in, in, uh, in automobiles. Uh, and this is not a commercial, so they'll just be calm. Uh, one, of these, one of the car manufacturers, there's this wild things afoot for those of you who are interested in, in the decadence of our time. Uh, here's a little note. It says, uh, here, where is my clipping here? I, I'm going to keep you abreast of what's happening in the nutty world. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. Here, here it is. It says, uh, new Pontiac engine has sex appeal. The Pontiac Motor Division of General Motors announced that their new engine, their new Big Six, is the first engine on the market with sex appeal. <laughs> well, that that uh, that conjures up some fascinating ideas. I can, <laughs> it it certainly does. I I, uh, I I is that male or female sex appeal to begin with? Uh, this is a you know a question I'd like to answer or ask at least. Uh, uh, an engine with sex appeal. Now I can understand a a car chassis with sex appeal, but uh, an engine with sex appeal. Now that is not the only thing that is happening in the world of automobiles, and that the uh, the sexual connotations. Can you imagine this guy going out in the garage, two o'clock in the morning? He's got this date with this overhead cam six, and uh, he goes out there and he opens up the hood, and uh, he's got this wild thing going with his engine. And uh, he's trapped by his chick, and she finds out that she that she's been two timed, and that all the time he's been making the scene with his Pontiac. And uh, so <laughs> eventually she goes out to she goes out to Reno, and she names the Pontiac Tempest as correspondent. And uh, <laughs> well, I mean, sex appeal. Let's face it. Here's another thing. If you, if you're interested in what's happening in the car world, I'll tell you. Uh, here's a note from. Uh, the post a couple of days ago and they're talking about new developments that uh, that the automobile is about to spring on us and here is one listen to this it says uh, you're driving home through the thick traffic weary after a rough day at the office you're still rankling over the heated exchange with the boss there is a persistent horn blower behind you a driver cut you off you blow your stack and step on the pedal determined to show up the offender and at that moment the engine cuts back Preventing your unwise acceleration. An electronic governor auditing your emotional and physical states has determined that you are in no condition to operate your vehicle rashly. The car stops and pulls over to the side and cools you off for five minutes before you can get underway again. How do you like that? Well, you know, uh, the, 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 the car syndrome is getting pretty sick in America in many ways. Have you seen that awful, terrible, rotten television show? My mother, the car. Holy smokes, what's sicky? Oh wow! Well, that's only part of it. Do you know that uh, that there are, are? I'll tell you what. Some of the uh, I shouldn't really, I suppose, be showing you trade secrets like this. But the motivational research division of one of the big Detroit automobile companies has realized that the automobile today no longer is a status symbol you know everybody talk about status no everybody can buy himself a used Cadillac that's easy so there's no status any longer with the car but there are very strong sexual connotations there's Oedipus connotations there's electric connotations all the whole thing is Narcissus is involved all kinds of Greek gods uh, <laughs> yeah Narcissus Oedipus the whole crowd and uh, they, they've even yes they, they've even detected a, a, a real a real big father image and the automobile has become, for the first time, a virility symbol for chicks. Yeah, and and uh, they've been conducting a lot of a lot of uh, experiments along this line, and they find that women these days are drawn to automobiles that have a strong virility quotient. That is what used to be called a masculine automobile, and and these single, tall, thin girls with mustaches are buying all these angry-looking automobiles. The whole point, of course, being that this is a problem. Now, what they're planning to do, they are planning to cater to the Oedipal involvement with a car. 
And in fact, they have tapes now, and they are experimenting. If you think I'm kidding, this is the truth. They are experimenting with cars that play through tape-recorded systems, mother sounds to the driver as he drives. Seriously. I'm telling you the truth. That say things, now watch out now, Sonny. Easy. Now watch it. Now, don't forget to be home on time now. Oh, it's all right now. Don't worry. Oh, don't let him get you mad. Mama is here to take care of you. And, and they are experimenting with this to see how far, just how far, man will go with his car. And by the way, if you're interested to know just how far we'll go, we'll be at the limelight tomorrow.